I would like to go ahead and welcome Session A, the World Health Organization Guidance on Maternal and Newborn Health during the coronavirus pandemic. This session is going to be presented by Mrs. Elizabeth Eero, the Chief Nurse of the World Health Organization, and Fran McConville, the Lead Midwife of the World Health Organization. I would like to go ahead and welcome Elizabeth. Elizabeth has a very extensive biography in maternal care. Before joining uh, the World Health Organization, she had more than 30 years of experience in public health in the Cook Islands and regionally. She was Secretary of Health for the Cook Islands. She implemented health reforms to strengthen the country's health systems. And this uh, involved developing many roadmaps and strategic plans for that. She also served as the country's chief nursing officer and acting director of hospital health services. For the first 25 years of her career, she was a staff nurse, midwife, and charge midwives at hospitals in the Cook Islands and New Zealand. It truly uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Elizabeth Eero to the conversation. And I'm just going to give you over a microphone. Jane, thank you very much. Um, I think I just want to say uh, the World Health Organization is definitely very honored to be joining the Virtual International Day of the Midwife and to share a recorded message from the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, on this very special occasion. So we'll start off with a message from the DG. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for um, for sharing that, info, that uh, video recording with everyone. I, as I said earlier, it's a, a real honor for WHO to be participating in this event. And I wanted to say a few more words. And to start off, I wanted to, to pay respect and tribute to the midwives who have died in the line of duty during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I extend my condolences to their families and friends. May the 5th is a special time for midwives, and this year even more so because it's happening in this international year of the nurse and the midwife, and during the worst global pandemic we have ever experienced. It is special because it is about you, midwives. Midwives alongside your nursing colleagues are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak, placing yourselves at personal risk of contracting the disease, working longer hours at risk of physiological distress, fatigue, burnout, stigma, and physical, and in some instances, psychological violence. And additionally, we're finding midwives are being placed away from expected mothers and newborns in some countries. You are being referred to as the heroes of our time. You continue to bring humanity through ensuring the continuity of respectful care a companion at the birth, skin to skin contact and the breastfeeding support that you so ably provide. I know that as you have accompanied women throughout history, you will continue to be by their sides throughout this pandemic and beyond. The midwifery profession demands exceptional knowledge, skills, patience and compassion. I congratulate those students who have chosen this profession as their career choice. I know that because of your courage and conviction, you continue to care for women and their babies, even when you are working in the toughest of environments and conditions, applying principles of infection prevention and control measures to ensure safety for both mother and baby. Your actions are courageous and selfless, and I thank you. The midwifery profession also demands up-to-date data and evidence. And I thank our midwifery researchers and educators for the work they do to inform and advance the practice and the profession. I want to take this time also to congratulate Caroline Homer, who has recently been appointed as the chair of the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group of Experts for Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Nutrition. May the 5th is your day 
the International Day of the Midwife, celebrate knowing that WHO is not only profoundly grateful to you all for the care you provide, the sacrifices that you make, and the extraordinary impact that you have on the lives of women, newborns, and their families everywhere, but that we are committed alongside our partners to continuing to support the strengthening of midwifery globally. Thank you, midwives. Celebrate your day, take care, and stay safe. It gives me now great pleasure and honor to introduce Fran McConville, the midwifery technical lead in the World Health Organization at headquarters in Geneva to continue the WHO presentation along the uh, guidance on maternal and newborn health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Fran. Well, hello everybody and um, thanks Elizabeth um, for, for setting the scene there and um, very, you know, huge thanks to Jane and her team for setting this up and asking WHO to speak and also happy International Day of the Midwife for me. It's fantastic actually being here in the UK and starting a little bit earlier. I love it and I hope you're all well. I think it's fantastic. So many people have been able to join and uh, I hope you keep well in these difficult times. So um, we all know uh, about COVID-19, and I just thought it would be helpful to put out a summary of, of some of the information that is coming out of WHO uh, that would be especially helpful for midwives. And uh, it is difficult as midwives and nurses sometimes to get hold of this information. Um, I've covered quite a lot of ground here, so um, I'll keep moving through it, but please um, do ask questions. Um, at the end and um, hope that we can answer most of them. Things are moving fast, as you all know, but we'll, we'll do our best. So uh, first of all, I thought I'd just um, give the update on the evidence and what it's got to do with maternal and newborn health. I just wanted to talk about what that means for us as midwives uh, during this pandemic and the continuity of essential services. And then think a little bit about so what happens next beyond this um, pandemic and the impact that it's going to have and the needs of women, newborns and of midwives. And then just run through a little bit about the, the thinking on future research and the documentation and policy dialogue that's already emerging. And then I, I've left a slide on some WHO resources. So um, first of all, we know this. I I'm not never going to stop saying it. Um, we know that midwifery care could avert more than 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths and neonatal deaths, where midwives are educated to international standards and midwifery includes the provision of family planning. Now, we know that came from Caroline Homer's article in paper two. As WHO, I've been absolutely delighted and stunned with the impact that that quote has had on governments all around the world and how it's changed their approach uh, to investing in midwifery, because I think for many years they thought it was okay, but they really couldn't put their finger on the evidence. So that will always remain, until the next Lancet series, a really critical uh, quote. So um, the other thing that I was so impressed with that came out of the Lancet that's having a very big impact is for many people, um, including where I work and where we all work and, and all the rest of it, they have this picture of the midwife with a mother giving birth and, and, it, and it's all fantastic and it's about childbirth, I think often they forget that midwifery education and care can improve over 50 other health related outcomes. Again from the Lancet series, all, uh, Mary and I put this together for the Framework for Action on Midwifery Education launched almost a year ago at the World Health Assembly. So we know it reduces mortality, it reduces serious morbidity, it reduces preterm birth and low birth weight. It increases satisfaction with childbirth and mother-baby interaction, reduces anxiety in labor, depression, newborn crying. It reduces unnecessary interventions such as augmentation of labor, instrumental births, cesarean sections, episiotomies, and unnecessary blood transfusions, but increases spontaneous vaginal birth. And of course, breastfeeding, the first and most important public health intervention 
uh, which sets us up for life is increased through midwifery, as well as birth spacing improving and immunization hugely important and reduces smoking in late pregnancy. And then of course, improved re referrals for complications um, and less time actually spent on the labor ward. So a huge wide um, vision of midwifery um, that we can now really openly talk about um, and use in everything we say. And I wanted to say that before I move on to COVID because this is what matters in COVID, that we continue to have these, this language, this evidence, and this conversation throughout the COVID pandemic. Whoopsie, sorry, I've gone too fast now. So when I think about what does this pandemic mean for midwifery, in essence, it really does not change quality midwifery care. And if we look at it, there is no current evidence, of course things change, but at the moment, that pregnant women who are infected with COVID-19 present with different signs and or symptoms or are at high risk of severe illness. And that in itself is really important in the way that, that some facilities have reacted uh, to pregnant women. So far, and fingers crossed, there is no clear evidence of mother to child transmission. Now that means um, through amniotic fluid, cold blood, vaginal discharge, neonatal, throat swabs or breast milk, very important. There is uncertain evidence of increased severe maternal or newborn outcomes because the evidence is really limited to infection in the third trimester because the evidence collected has really been so recent. So we're watching that one, um, but we know that at, at the moment there is really no certain evidence. Um, we do, however, as WHO recommend that pregnant women with symptoms should be prioritised for testing. So what we need to do is remember absolutely good quality midwifery, but we do need to adapt to maternal uh, uh, to adapt our maternal and newborn services. And I can I can't say this enough. We can do what we want as we normally do, but we must strengthen infection prevention and control to prevent or limit the transmission in the facilities as well as in outreach and in community services. We must establish triage, early recognition and source control at entry into the hospital or the ward. Now that could be antenatal, during childbirth, postnatal care, and adjust our personal protective equipment, our PPE, and infection prevention and control strategies accordingly. Now that's a huge, huge task. We have to avoid moving and transporting patients. Now this is for women who are COVID positive as well, so they're sick, out of their room or area unless medically necessary. And if transport is required, use predetermined routes and have the patient wear a medical mask. And of course, this is important for companion at birth. It's important to have that companion at birth, but to limit the number of health workers, family members and visitors who are in contact with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 um, pregnant and childbearing women. And when I think of some of the countries where WHO works and often you'll have very large numbers of family coming in to the hospital. And that's really got to be taken care of very seriously um, to make sure that the woman and a companion are there, but not the rest of it. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, it's very important that these services are sustained. And uh, so we've got to sustain the routine services and care and the management of complications, but we must not ignore women's choices, their rights to sexual and reproductive health care, and these must be respected regardless. So for example, access to contraception and safe abortion to the full extent of the law really must continue. There's no reason why that should stop. Um, we have to establish that uh, triage and source control again of COVID infected women and adjust our PPE. And we must ensure an appropriate physical environment with adequate water, sanitation, energy, medicine, supplies and equipment. Now that's easy to say in many countries, but as you know, about 40% of health facilities facilities globally are without water or sanitation. So it is really tough in those environments to keep this adequate, adequate, appropriate environment clean and safe for the midwife as well as for others. So I think we really have to think about how we support midwives in those environments where it's really, really difficult. So health facilities really must prioritise infection prevention and control strategies. So special considerations where a woman is infected um, uh, and it depends on the severity of the disease 
but she she really there's very few reasons why she wouldn't have a companion of choice um, if she doesn't have the appropriate infection prevention me measures and if that companion is educated about it told what it means um, and has everything that they need they must continue to have pain relief they should be able to move around and be upright and in places where there are functioning midwifery programs midwife led continuity of con continuity of care should continue there's no need for this to be taken over by an obstetric only team or by a medical team and of course if a, if a woman has to go um, for a cesarean section and she's covid positive you stay with her uh, and you come back with her afterwards so that continuity of care is there and you stay with her uh, while she's sick um, so please do share and use those infographics um, that are there on the right um, for special considerations when a woman is COVID-19 and she has complications, WHO still recommends that medical interventions, including caesarean, induction of labour and episiotomy, are only carried out when medically justified. And we've all heard that actually this is not happening everywhere and that in some places there's been a sudden spike in caesarean section, inductions um, and episiotomy. So we really have to watch that one. WHO also recommends that antenatal cortis corticosteroid therapy uh, for women at risk of preterm birth from 24 to 34 weeks where there is no clinical evidence of maternal infection and adequate childbirth and new care, uh, newborn care is available so we still recommend that but where there is mild COVID-19 the balance of benefits and harms for the woman should be discussed with a specialist the standard midwifery referral for a woman who's really not well now this slide, it seems almost crazy that we have to put it up, uh, but we do know at the beginning of this outbreak that there was quite a lot of advice out there saying, stop, stop, women shouldn't breastfeed, which is not correct. So WHO recommends that all women should be supported to breastfeed. As mentioned earlier on, there is no evidence of transmission through breast milk. Um, so they, babies and, babies and mums should stay together there should be skin to skin contact, kangaroo mother care where needed and rooming in day and night. Again, with those um, infection prevention and control measures. And for mothers who can't breastfeed during the first hour of birth, possibly because they're very sick from COVID, um, they should still be supported to breastfeed as soon as they are able. And um, whatever their status, mothers should continue to have that wonderful breastfeeding counselling, basic psychosocial support practical feeding support um, and this should be provided by trained healthcare professionals, community-based professionals, lay and peer breastfeeding counsellors and on the right you'll see there should be no promotion of breast milk substitutes, feeding bottles and teats, pacifiers or dummies in any part of facilities providing maternity and newborn services or by any other staff and this is so important at the moment. Now you can see I'm reading this stuff off and what I had forgotten to say early on is these slides are forming um, what will soon be launched as a um, training app that will be launched globally for anyone caring for mothers, um, babies and their families uh, globally. So um, what I'm saying, you know, it will come out um, as, a, as a slide set, but also as a training app to be shared and used widely. So. Um, just in terms of uh, breastfeeding, it's very important again to protect the mothers. So a bit more emphasis now on washing hands before and after breastfeeding, practicing good respiratory hygiene, which does mean wearing a medical mask where possible, coughing or sneezing into the bent elbow or tissue and bent elbow for women who don't have a box of tissues to hand, as many, many do not, and disposing of those tissues immediately and routine cleaning and disinfecting services that have been touched. So a little bit more attention um, to all of that during breastfeeding these days. So those are the slides that have come out of the, um, the app, which we hope will be released any moment. Um, and I just wanted to take you um, into a slightly different discussion now, which is uh, really about what impact is COVID having on maternal, newborn, child and adolescent health, including sexual and reproductive health. And um, I think, I hope you'll find this interesting because we're just trying to find out what is the long-term impact of, of uh, reductions in services and lack of access. 
um, on, on where we are. And as you know, we have made the most tremendous gains in reducing maternal mortality and newborn mortality over the last two to three decades. And there is such a risk now that we will lose those gains um, because of this pandemic. And there is much on our shoulders as midwives to make sure that that doesn't happen. So if we start with the top row, uh, which is about family planning, and I might try and use this pencil here and see if I can make it happen. Um, if we look at this, if this lockdown continues for three months, up to two million additional women may be unable to access and use modern contraceptives. Now, if that goes on for six months, it would be seven million unintended pregnancies. That is absolutely huge. Now, that's, that is a time frame estimate of six months of lockdown. It's based on Ebola outbreak disruptions applied to estimates of current, current modern contraceptive users in 114 low and middle income countries. And you can see it comes from Avenir Health, John Hopkins and Victoria University in Australia and UNFPA. So it's just fabulous to see people starting to pull this data together, but it's really quite worrying. Now, if you move to maternal and newborn health and you look at excess maternal under five mortality from weak systems um, and lower utilization of 72 essential reproductive maternal newborn and child health services in two scenarios with two types of disruption scenarios, this is what you get. Reductions in coverage of around 15% for six months would result in an additional 253,500 additional child deaths and 12,190 additional maternal deaths. And then if this goes on with reductions in coverage of around 45% for six months, we're looking at 1.157 uh, additional child deaths and 57, sorry, 56,000 additional maternal deaths. And that is absolutely terrifying. So um, we're going to continue to work on this data, but I just wanted to highlight to you what is at risk here if we cannot continue to give good quality midwifery care to all women and newborns everywhere throughout this pandemic. So that's why the Director General, who you, you just heard in that video, and by the way, he loves midwives. He thinks you're absolutely brilliant. <laughs> uh, he, he knows that. Uh, he did a, a special call to attention to essential health services. And he raised the issue that there's rapidly increasing demand on health facilities and health workers for COVID care threatens to leave some health systems so overstretched that they would be unable to operate effectively. And previous outbreaks, breaks, um, SARS, MERS, Ebola and others, have demonstrated that when health systems are overwhelmed, death due to vaccine preventable and treatable conditions increase dramatically. And I don't know about many of you, but I remember being in Bangladesh in the early 80s when one of the biggest causes of death for mothers and babies was, was tetanus. And, you know, the idea of going back to a time where women didn't have their routine tetanus um, vaccinations, you know, before pregnancy would be absolutely awful. We've forgotten what it looks like. We've forgotten how to treat it. We've forgotten what happens to babies. Um, and so we've got to keep those vaccinations continuing as well as all the, the other childhood vaccines. Um, so essential health services really must continue. Babies are still being born. Vaccines must be delivered and people still need life saving treatment for many issues. And what I didn't show you is the similar data on vaccine preventable diseases, malaria, HIV, we're going to lose a lot of gains made if we can't continue these essential health services that midwives are so essential to. Um, so this is just to, just to show you that there is this document on operational guidance for maintaining essential health services during the outbreak, again, to prioritise essential, and that includes pregnancy, childbirth and the postnatal period, and we must never forget that. We have to optimise our service delivery settings and platforms. So we have to look at um, targeted outreach, use of telephones, teleconsultation, many things that I know that you'll be doing and talking about over the next few hours. We've got to look at effective uh, patient flow, screening isolation, keeping it moving, rapidly redistribute health workforce capacity by reassignment and task sharing, but not taking midwives away from caring, doing midwifery work and putting them somewhere else and leaving women and babies without midwifery care. That's really important. 
um, but keeping the trust of the population um, as we move forward by keeping this infection prevention control going. I won't go through all of this, but just to say that mental health and psychosocial care for midwives increase, increasingly important as this pro, um, pandemic progresses. And if we look at um, the SARS epidemic in 2003, there's a 30% increase in suicide of people around 65, around 50% of recovered patients remain anxious, and 29% of health group workers experience probable emotional distress. That's a lot given that over half of health workers are women, most of them nurses and midwives. Um, and a lot of the consequences of quarantine associated social and physical distancing measures are themselves a key risk factor for mental health. Substance abuse, gambling, cyber bullying, feeling a burden, bereavement, loss um, and, and relationship breakdown, all things that affect midwives. And we've really got to continue to support midwives and women, babies and their families right the way through this epidemic. So, you know, we have I know we've always done that, but we've really got to focus on that as well now. So I, I won't spend too long on this. Um, I just wanted to just remind everybody that once the baby's born and we go back and care for a woman with that wonderful moment of postnatal care and, and the family are there, um, we have to, as midwives, just be aware also that these children are not the face of this pandemic. Of course, that's the elderly, but they do risk being among its biggest victims, falling into poverty, exacerbating um, the learning crisis, school, threats to child survival and health and risk to safety. So as midwives, I think we have a very special place with the continuity of child-centered um, services as referral, um, being aware of protections that might be needed for vulnerable children, providing that early practical support in the postnatal period um, and ensuring child services wherever we can um, uh, get, get started again as the lockdown measures um, unwind. And then, um, a little bit on elderly. Now, I, I won't go into this into too much, but, you know, we all know many, many babies will go home with their mums and dads in the postnatal period and, and they'll be with their grandparents in the house. And, and so I think, again, as midwives, in the care that we give in the community, just to remember that those grandparents need support as well and, and um, to, to keep on top of that while we're giving our postnatal care and hand over to other health workers. Um, so I know there's many of you here from the research community, absolutely amazing research uh, community of midwives. And I just thought I would highlight these few points as to where we are now in WHO um, on research priorities around the COVID um, pandemic. So of course, the natural history of the virus is transmission and diagnosis. We're still finding out more. Um, we're trying to find out much more about the origin of the virus. Um, there are a lot of epidemiological studies going on. Uh, we need to understand better clinical characterization and management, including in uh, pregnant women and children. We're not really sure what's going on in children. We've got to get better at infection prevention and control. We talk a lot about PPE and water and sanitation. It's not easy. How do we best protect our healthcare workers? Um, a lot of research and development going on for candidate therapeutics. You'll hear all that um, in the news as much as I will. A lot of the news is coming from WHO. Um, research and development, oh sorry, that's a, uh, for, oh sorry, for candidate vaccines. Um, and very excitingly coming out of our department now is um, the maternal and newborn child health department is collaborative global research network um, on maternal newborn child and adolescent health under development. And I'm, I'm really enjoying this because I think if ever there was a time we all had to work together, uh, now is it. And we can see researchers coming together as they never have been. Um, recognising that we must work together to end this um, pandemic through research. So just a very brief summary. Um, you know, we, we've, we're sort of, these are the current situation and, and key insights. We know there are direct and indirect effects, uh, lives, livelihoods, ways of life. We really do need to work, including for midwifery, national strategies, international cooperation. Um, I know when, um, with, with the massive refugee movement, in Europe over the last few years, it's been international cooperation across Europe that has kept women being cared for as they move across Europe. Um, we do need to transition now to a steady state of low level or no transmission and midwives are going to have to keep moving on that and adjusting, but we must accelerate research innovation and knowledge sharing amongst midwives so that we're at the front foot of this and we're not constantly trying to catch up with what's going on from others. So for midwives, as well as everyone else, it's about the speed of how we act, 
It's about the scale at which we act as midwives. And it's about equity. And I think that's where we are so important, making sure that no one is left behind and all women um, have access to this care and know that they can breastfeed, know that they can have a companion, uh, know that they'll be cared for if they're sick and, and, and all the rest of it. So these are a few resources. Um, th this is the page from um, the department that I work on. There's a whole load of stuff on there um, about COVID, maternal newborn health, and, and the training app will be on there as many, as many other places. So please do visit it. Um, I wanted to let you know that we do have clinical guidelines on the management of COVID. Now, this is a lot about um, respiratory distress and how much oxygen uh, women need. So perhaps not so relevant to all of us. But I just thought I'd let you know that, um, as I'm sure many of you know, WHO guidelines are a very long process. Many of you are involved in them, um, and thanks for that. Um, at the moment, we just don't have that two to three years to get the research together and um, set up the steering groups and all the rest of it. So we're having to um, move very fast and issue interim guidelines. Um, and we have a clinical network that's continuously sharing the data and field experiences, and new topics for guidance are identified or current guidance is updated. And it's very important that your comments that you make here and the questions that you ask, even if we don't have time, or I can't answer them, which is very likely, that we collect those and I will send them back to the team and they will continue to develop guidance for the things that you're asking about. It's been really helpful for us to have those questions and it's happening every day and we really value them. So here's a page just with a lot of updated links um, and I'm sure that this will be available. Um, so please do use them. Um, they're coming out all the time. I know there's going to be a new breastfeeding one very soon. There's going to be a new guidance on um, essential health services. There's one coming out very soon on communities, how to ensure that communities continue to be involved. But this is where we are now. And I just thought you'd like to know that there is a global survey of health workers. And I would just love it that all of you on this um, wonderful International Day of the Midwife send this round, share it and participate. Um, it's WHO and the International Labour Organization together. We are really worried about what's going on with frontline health workers, midwives especially. Um, and we want to know how you are, how safe you are, what level of protection you have at the workplace. And whatever we get back and it will trickle in and we'll keep watching, these results will inform what we do about targeting the most important risks for health and safety of you guys and what preventive measures are needed. And it's going to contribute to raising awareness amongst responders about the risk for health and safety and their prevention. And it is going to be, well, it is already available in all these languages. So um, please do participate and share as widely as possible. Your voices are so important in this. I, I'm very concerned that we get lots of doctors and, and, and others, but that we really don't have midwives. So to have midwives with a strong voice here would be so influential, it would be fabulous. And then, you know, it's 200 years <laughs> next week since um, the wonderful Florence Nightingale, who I think is incredible, was incredible. I'm a complete Florence fan. Um, and I've been very concerned about the progress we've made, as some of you know, over the past 200 years in terms of the, the recognition and appreciation and pay, for example, um, and the gender power dynamics around nurses, midwives, um, 200 years after uh, the profession was professionalized, um, particularly in the UK. I know it, it had happened in, in other countries as well. Um, and I just love this quote of hers, um, which is obviously about 170 years ago, which is, no man, not even a doctor, ever gives any other definition of what a nurse should be than this, devoted and obedient. This would do just as well for a porter. It might even do for a horse. It would not do for a policeman. Now, to, to those of you, some of you might want to think back to Victorian UK, horses were the most important thing of everything, um, especially for the military. So we weren't quite up there. We weren't up there with the horses. Um, but and I'd be quite concerned. But I have to say, in the last few weeks, watching this COVID pandemic um, and listening to what Elizabeth just said now, all of a sudden this language is changing and we are being described as the heroes of our time. Um, and the most trusted of professionals. And I just think that's such a tribute to you as midwives um, and all of you working out there. It's quite clear that the, um, the profile um, that you're having, the vision you're having, is probably unmatched since what Florence Nightingale did. I think it's quite fabulous. So we've got to keep that up and we've got to make sure it translates into investment 
and better pay and better working conditions and recognition and all sorts of other things. Um, and now, now I'm just going to indulge because um, this is a poet, a spoken poet called Holly McNish. And please, please visit her. She's quite fantastic. And she wrote this poem, which always, always makes me feel great and makes me laugh. And um, I find quite emotional as well. But it's an apology from her and an ode to midwives. And so this is my thank you to you, all of you, through Holly McNish's poem. And she says, sometimes I lie and I say I'm a midwife. When strangers on trains ask what I do, I want them to think I am good. I want them to look at my hand and imagine those hands have held more than a pen. I want them to think I have run between bedsides, mermaid to ships, carrying sailors to safety on shores, delivering life or toast or condolences, comforting those in the midst of an earthquake, sewing stitches in skin like life-saving tapestries, sitting for seconds, catching breath between screens. So I just love that's her thank you. And it's my thank you to you all. And with that, I just want to put this up on the screen. This is um, from midwives in the Western Pacific, Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand. And this is a huge tapestry that they wove at a WHO collaborating centre um, in Australia over two years ago. And you can see um, whether we call it the egg, the placenta, whatever's in the middle, and then the hands of midwives all the way around, and then the rivers of love and joy. And they've done all their fantastic drawings all over that. So um, because we're starting really in that region, I just thought we'd make sure that they had a, a beautiful picture there and that was painted um, through this beautiful ethnic group of people. So thank you to midwives all around the world on this really special day of International Day of the Midwife in 2020. And where on earth would we be without you? You are more valued than you will ever understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fran, so much. And welcome everyone again to our celebration and our presentations for International Day of the Midwife. I'd love to hear first, is there any questions in Spanish that we might hear for Fran? Um, ¿Hay alguna pregunta en español que quisieran tipearla en, la, en el chat? I don't have any Spanish questions yet, Jane. Thank you. And is there any other questions for Fran? Or we just have so much gratitude to everyone from the World Health Organization. So fantastic presentation uh, from the Director General, Dr. Tedros, to Mrs. Elizabeth Aero, and to yourself, um, Fran. We really, really appreciate you so much. Oh, and is it Becky? It says, do you recommend washing with water and soap before skin to skin after birth? Uh, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Sorry, I managed to disconnect myself. <laughs> yeah, you sound great, Fran. <laughs> um, yes, uh, yes, uh, soap and water is good um, before skin to skin, yeah. So um, it, it's just very, very, oh, oh so I'm, I, Becky, can you just clarify that? Certainly washing hands, but um, actually not the woman's body because that skin to skin is so important. What, what you don't want is, is to have, um, you know, COVID from your face or from sneezing on your hands when you're holding the baby. Um, but what you do want the baby is to go straight skin to skin. Does that make sense? I think that makes perfect sense. And I really appreciated you clarifying um, I know initially I, I live in the United States and we were told, oh, you must separate the newborn from the mother. And I found that very distressing. So I really appreciate that. We are going to share um, uh, all the links um, that uh, Fran kindly shared with us today. And please, um, when we will share the survey monkey widely, please uh, complete the survey because we need your voices around the world. It's so very important uh, to midwifery. And I'm not sure if there's um, any other questions um, in Spanish for us. Uh, 
I don't think so. That's fantastic. So I'll, I'll let the oh, and Beck is asking, can the virus also be on the body? Do you mean the body of the baby or of us or as midwives? Can you clarify? Hi, um, maybe I'll just um, try and respond to that. Uh, you know, we know it, it's not passed um, through childbirth, you know, um, vaginal fluids, whatever. Um, so if it's if it's on the mother's body, it's because she sneezed on her hands or touched her face and then put her hands on her, her tummy, which is why the hand washing is so important. Um, but, you know, there shouldn't be, it, it, it's just a respiratory thing. If, if, if the baby's coming straight, um, onto the mother's uh, skin and the mother hasn't sneezed on her tummy or wiped her hands after a sneeze on her tummy, it should be fine. I, I see I see a question about the virus being transmitted in breast milk and at the moment, no, we have no evidence that, that it is transmitted in breast milk. I also see a comment about uh, BAME women. Um, and I, we're just trying to find out about that. There's, um, what's very interesting is um, I've been asking in my department how we're collecting that data about BME and midwives. And the interesting thing is very few countries are collecting that data. Um, and, and where they are, it's not at scale. So we really don't know what's going on with um, ethnic minorities and midwives working with ethnic minorities. But at least the discussion has started. So I was very good uh, to see it coming up in the question question there. And in, in the interest of time, um, Janine, to answer your question, we do have um, Rebecca Decker is doing a session on evidence-based birth and COVID-19. And I do believe there's other um, speakers going to be addressing the emotional well-being uh, on that. So I think that was so incredible, Fran. I'm going to go ahead and...